Today I want to clear up some of the most common myths surrounding compression. Why? Because there are so many compressors out there available on the market and so many producers seem to struggle with it. And frankly, it's quite a confusing subject, at least it was for me when I was starting. Now please bear in mind these are just my opinions. You might not like them, you might completely disagree with them and that's absolutely fine, but I just want to share with you what I found has worked for my music over the past 25 years and what's helped my students get signed to some of the world's biggest labels. Okay, cool, with that caveat in mind, let's get to it. So myth number one one is everything should be compressed. So before we get into my story about this myth, first let's look at the basic controls of all compressors. So compressors control the dynamic range of a sound. This means they can change the differential between the loudest part of the sound and the quietest part of sound, bringing them closer together. Now, some compressors can do more than that, and we're gonna to touch upon that in a few minutes, but the four most basic controls of a compressor are the threshold, the ratio, the attack, and the release. Now, the best ever analogy to understand these controls is think of a compressor like your mum. If you're listening to music up in your room because suddenly you're a teenager again, the threshold is the level at which your music's playing when your mum shouts upstairs at you to turn it down. The ratio is the amount by which you turn it down when she shouts at you, and the attack is how quickly you turn it down when she shouts at you. The release is how quickly you turn it back up again when she's gone away. I wish I made that analogy up, but I didn't. It's brilliant, isn't it? Now, I first discovered compression when I downloaded Propellerhead's Reason in probably the year 2000, and up to that point, I'd just be using my Amiga 500 with a few external synths, and I'd never invested and a compressor, so I didn't really know what it was. Now there was a software compressor included in Reason, so I got to playing with it, and at first it completely confused me, but then when I realized what it could do, it enamored me. And the trouble with that was I started putting it on everything, thinking it was gonna make my music sound really loud and really fat. But what happened was most of the time my music just ended up really weird and pumping and squashed and I couldn't figure out how my music still wasn't sounding as loud and as fat as my favourite producers. And look, I think this is pretty natural. When we discover a tool for the first time, an exciting new tool, we tend to put it on too many things because we're excited and we think it's going to fix everything. But what I learned was that actually by compressing less I could get my mixes sounding louder and more clear. And there are a few reasons for that, so let's go through them. The first reason is that a lot of samples that come in sample packs have already been compressed. So if you think of a kick drum or a snare drum from Splice or somewhere like that, they're already peaking at 0 dB, and if you start compressing it even more, the chances are you can dial in settings on the compressor that are going to contradict the natural compression that's already baked into the sample. So here's an example of a sample that's already been compressed, and then I'm going to put a compressor on top of it and we can hear what happens. So it actually sounded better before I applied the compression. The second reason is that if you think of the entire processing chain, you're probably going to have some compression at the group or the bus level, and you're definitely going to have some on the master channel for the mastering stage. So every single compressor that you're adding into this chain is just squashing that sound more and more. Now, of course, there are exceptions to that rule. For example, if you're recording live instruments like a vocal or a guitar, that's going to have a lot more dynamic range. So you are going to need a lot more compression. So here's an example of me recording my voice and you can see it's quite dynamic so let's look what happens when we compress it so here's an example of me recording my voice and you can see it's quite dynamic we can see that the quiet parts are made louder and the loud parts are made a bit quieter reducing that dynamic range but as you can see there's a logical reason behind that so my rule of thumb is generally speaking if in doubt compress less okay myth number two is that compression just controls dynamics now most people think that compressors just control the volume of the sound over time much like using the controls that we looked at in the first myth and whilst that is true of some compressors other compressors can actually change the tonality or the character of the sound as well as the dynamic range. So here's an example of a sound put through three different compressors. Have a listen and see if you can hear the difference in tone between each. These are the good things, good things, good things. These are the good things, good things, good things. These are the good things, good things, good things. Did you hear the difference? The chances are you didn't hear the difference between example one or example two, or you're much less likely to, but you did hear the difference between the third example and the other two. So which of these compressors do affect the sound in this way, and which ones should you be using for which circumstance? It kind of implies that you need loads of different compressors for different purposes, right? Well, not so fast. And that brings me on to myth number three, which is you need loads of different compressors to sound professional. As you're doubtless aware, music production is very complicated and it's a very in-depth subject. And if you're just starting out, trust me, you will find this out soon enough. But don't worry, because it's still a 
amazing fun, but one of the biggest blocks to learning music production is simply overwhelm. People get overwhelmed at the sheer amount of stuff there is to learn. So the question then is, what should you learn and in what order? Well, where you don't start is on the subtle differences between the UAD and the Waves and the Black Rooster audio versions of the classic 1176 compressor versus the equivalent remakes of the 2A or the 3A, blah, blah, blah. You can do everything you need with just three types of compressor and your stock plugins are absolutely fine. Sure, if you've been producing for two or three years or more, you might benefit from these slight nuances, but if not, it will probably only serve to confuse you. So here are the three main types of compressor in my estimation. One is just a normal compressor. Two is a glue or a bus compressor. And number three is a multiband compressor. This simple categorization should make life easier. And sure, of course, you could have multiple plugins for each of those categories, but you don't need them, at least not until you've been producing for a while. The main point is learning where each of these three main categories of compressor is going to be used until you know the effect they have on a sound and you learn them inside out. So really quickly, let's touch upon them. A normal compressor is really useful for just reining in the dynamic range of a sound, manipulating the peaks and the transients and getting it sounding how you like. For example, here's a normal compressor on a vocal. And baby, I want you more and more each passing day, though I may not say so. We're allowing the transient of the vocal through. We're making sure that the compressor is closed off by the time she sings the next lyric. And we're just bringing it all together a bit closer so it's a bit more sausage-like instead of very, very dynamic. Boom. That's it. And apart from the vocals and maybe a couple of other things, I probably wouldn't use compression directly on a sound for most of the things in the track. Okay, the second is glue or bus compression. These tend to have a smoother outcome. You've got less control over the attack and the release. And the most popular type of bus compression is an SSL solid state compressor. But if you're using Ableton, the glue compressor is absolutely fine. And there's the equivalent in Logic as well. Okay, the third is a multiband compressor. And this is simply where you add compression, but for different frequencies bands within a sound. And this is a surefire way to almost certainly ruin your mix if you don't know what you're doing. A popular use for a multiband compressor, for me at least, is on the master channel where you can just tighten up, say, the kick and the low end, allowing the mids and the high end to just breathe a bit more in the mix. But you could use a multiband compressor if you are compressing, say, a bass guitar and you want some of those upper harmonics to be less compressed than the bass. A similar idea to the mastering chain, but again, multiband compression is a very specific tool that you probably won't need to use that much. Okay, myth number four is, is there a magic setting for my compressor that's gonna make everything sound amazing? The amount of emails I've received asking if there's specific compression settings that are perfect for a vocal chain is, well, lots. But the truth of the matter is, it depends on one, the signal going into the compressor, two, the tempo of the track you're working on, and three, what effect or outcome you're actually going for. This is like asking if there's a magic setting on an oven that will cook all food perfectly. Of course there's not, but when you understand what the controls of the oven will do, and the characteristics of the stuff you're putting in the oven, is this analogy still working? Then you, can, <laughs> then you can match those two things together and get a really good result. Having said that, there are a few rules of thumbs which might help, so let's go through them. One, if you want the transients of drums to pop through, for example, if you're using some glue compression on your drum bus, having a longer attack of about 30 milliseconds will allow those transients to pop through the mix. Two, if you want your vocals to sound quite natural, you'll need a slightly longer attack and release. Seems there's never time to appreciate all the lovely things you do. But if you really want to lock in those peaks and get an upfront in your face sound, you'll want a shorter attack. Seems there's never time to appreciate all the lovely things you do. And three, in general, in terms of release, you basically want to make sure that after each peak of compression, the compressor has a chance to go back to zero when it comes to the gain reduction. Otherwise, you're likely to end up with like a squashed, horribly compressed sound. And unless there's a very specific creative reason you're choosing to do that, you probably don't want it. Okay, myth number five is compression is how you make your music louder. You make your music louder by turning up the volume. <laughs> Compression can be a part of what makes your track louder, as in average loudness rather than peak, but it all starts in the sound selection and the composition, as well as several other mixing and processing techniques you can use like saturation and equalization. So here's an example of just using compression to get perceived loudness, and then we'll listen to that same example but using a bit of EQ and saturation beforehand.
Hear how we've just got more space to breathe in the second example? And that's why you probably struggle to get your music sounding as loud as your favourite producers without losing clarity and punch, if you're just relying on compression. And actually I would argue that spending some more time on the sound selection and the composition, then using a bit of saturation and EQ is an easier thing to get right than just trying to rely on compression, which I find is easier to get wrong. Okay, myth number six is the chain placement. Much like the perfect settings myth, I also see producers either fixated on having the compressor in the same place in every chain that they use. For example, it must be after the saturator and the EQ every time to get the best results. Or the flip side of that, paying absolutely no heed to the order of the plugin chain whatsoever. Now, I would say that the first mistake is better than the second one because at least they're being aware of the fact that the order of the plugins does make a difference. But depending on what you're trying to achieve, there isn't a one size fits all solution. I'm gonna give you one really quick example of this so you can hear the difference it makes. Now, in this example, I'm going to put on a bit more reverb than I would usually, just so you can hear the difference. So this is the vocal dry. These are the good things, good things, good things. These are the and we can see it's got compression. It's actually going through a sidechain compressor as well. So let's turn on some of that reverb at the end of the chain. These are the good things, good things, good things. These are the good things, good things, good things. We can hear there's plenty of time for that reverb tail to die out. Now let's move it to the beginning of the chain before all the compressors and listen to the difference. And I'm gonna switch between the two so you can hear. So we can hear the reverb is now being ducked and compressed and bounced as well. Let's switch back. And that's gonna make a huge difference in the mix. And that's why understanding what's happening to the sound, what's happening throughout the signal path is so important because it allows you to visualize and conceptualize what's actually being done to the sound. So you can craft each specific sound and situation to your needs. And look, overall compression is a tool just like any other. You wouldn't pick up a hammer and start bashing away at the wall without having a specific purpose and knowledge that the hammer is the right tool for that job. Intention is everything. If you can conceptualize and visualize what you're trying to achieve with your sound, then you can work out which tool to reach for. And as I mentioned, compression is, of course, only one of many powerful and essential tools when it comes to getting the perfect mix, which is why compression can actually end up hurting rather than helping if you don't understand the other tools at your disposal. So with that in mind, I put together the 14 mixing tips I wish, I wish someone had told me when I started my career over 25 years ago, because it would have literally saved me years. So I hope you found this video useful. I hope you enjoyed it. And thank Thank you so much for watching. Okay, I will catch you over at that next video where we will transform your mixes in just a few short steps.